Heroes, Chapter 9 Larry LaSalle was one of the first French town men to enlist in the armed services, announcing his intention on Monday afternoon following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor a few hours after President Roosevelt's address on the radio declared that a state of war existed between Japan and the United States. Patriotic fever mixed with rage over the sneak attack in the Pacific ran rampant through the streets of Frenchtown and according to radios and newspapers throughout the nation. Recruiting offices were immediately thronged with men and women answering the call to fight for their country. Larry LaSalle stood before us that afternoon at the rec centre. The movie star Smile, gone, replaced by grim-faced determination. We can't let the Japs get away with this, he said, anger that we had never seen before flashing in his eyes. As we were about to cheer his announcement, he held up his hand. None of that, kids. I'm just doing what millions of others are doing. Larry's action became for us the beginning of wartime in Frenchtown. Other enlistments followed as fathers and brothers joined the armed forces. People gathered daily in Monument Square to say goodbye to the men being carried by buses to Fort Delta to enlist in the Army and Air Force and by train to the headquarters of the Marines and Navy in Boston. The French town factories went on 24-hour schedules as they began to manufacture material for the war effort. We don't make guns and bombs, Uncle Louis said at supper one night, but our men need everyday things, combs and brushes, knives and forks. Life goes on, even in the service. I'd heard rumours that the Monument Comb Shop, where Uncle Louis worked, was producing secret material in a special section of the factory. He lifted a gnarled finger to his lips. Shh, he said. A thrill went through me. A wartime secret in Frenchtown. Should we be on the lookout for spies? Larry LaSalle's enlistment caused the rec centre to close for what people now called the duration. The kids of Frenchtown hung out in St Jude's schoolyard or in front of Laurier's drugstore. Within a short time, the absence of young men on the French town streets was noticeable. At the Sunday masses, Father Balthazar prayed from the pulpit for the safety of our men and women in the services. Women, too, had begun to show up in uniform. They were called waves and spars and walked the streets with a pride in their step that wasn't there when they were shop girls in the factories. Young people and women took over some of the jobs in stores and factories. Mr Laurier hired me to work part-time after school and on weekends at his drugstore. I ran errands, swept floors, took out the rubbish and filled the shelves with stock from the back room. My special pleasure was stocking the candy cases with Tootsie Rolls, butterscotch bits and the big five-cent candy bars like Baby Ruth and Mr Goodbar. Mr Laurier, always suave and dapper in his white shirt and black bow tie, paid me two dollars and fifty cents a week and treated me to a chocolate frappe on Saturday afternoon after handing me the money. Nicole Raynard dropped into the drugstore once in a while. She sometimes lingered after picking out her favourite candy. Butterscotch bits, three for a penny. She too had discovered the Monument Public Library and told me how she wept as she read the final pages of A Farewell to Arms. That's my favourite novel, I said. Have you read Rebecca? she asked. No, but I saw the movie, I replied, amazed that we were carrying on a normal conversation. I did too, but I like the books better, she said. Which do you like best, movies or books? Both, I said. Me too and then a sudden silence, but a good silence, as she offered me a butterscotch bit. Taking a deep breath, I said, Would would you like to go to the movie sometime? The earth paused in its orbit. That would be nice, she said at last. Saturday afternoons at the Plymouth downtown became our weekly date. The word made my head spin. I was actually dating Nicole Reynard. 
We met in front of the theatre, and she insisted on buying her own ticket, although she allowed me to treat her to milk duds from the vending machine in the lobby. The theatre was always crowded and raucous. The Saturday matinees a special time for kids, with a cowboy serial and two movies. The movie tone news brought reminders of the war that was raging around the globe, as the grim narrator spoke of places that had been unknown to us a few months ago. Baton in the Pacific, Tobruk in Africa. We cheered our fighting forces and booed and hissed when Hitler came on the screen, his arm always raised in that hated salute. At some point during the afternoon, we held hands, her hand cool in mine, but I had to keep drawing mine away to wipe the sweat from my palm. Just before the end of the last movie appeared on the screen, she allowed me an innocent kiss, our lips briefly touching, the taste of peppermint transferred from her lips to mine. Once, my hand accidentally dropped and brushed her sweater, and I was surprised at the softness of her breast. <laughs> my hand lingered there for a moment, and she didn't protest. My breath went away and then, then came back again as we rose to leave. On the way home, we talked not only about the movies we had seen, but, but a thousand other things. I was amazed at the lack of pauses in our conversation, how I always managed to have something to say. She had a way of teasing which coaxed me into forgetting my shyness. What do you want to do besides be a champion at table tennis? I don't know, my mind racing. What did I want to do? You must want to do something, Francis. Say the first thing that comes into your mind. I want to read every book in the in the monument a monument public library. Good, she said. How about writing books? Didn't you win Sister Matilde's medal for composition? A blush of both pleasure and embarrassment made my cheeks grow warm. Oh, I could never write a book. <laughs> I think you could. It was necessary to change the subject. How about you, Nicole? What do you want to do? Oh, lots of things, she said, raising her head and looking round at the passing French town three-deckers, the steeple of St. Jude's in the distance. Such a big world out there. I'd like to help more in the war. Maybe become a nurse if the war lasts long enough. I knew that she spent time with the nuns at the convent, knitting socks and scarves for the armed forces. I teased her about the smell of cut cabbage she carried with her when she dropped into Laurier's after leaving the convent. The convent's perfume, I said, thinking myself clever. Not a bad smell, Francis, she said. Better than evening in Paris, which was the cheap perfume that was our best seller at the store. Once, as we passed the rec centre, I started to sing Dancing in the Dark, in a comic way, off-key as usual, because I love to hear her laugh, but she didn't laugh this time. That was a sad party, wasn't it? She said. I agreed, thinking of that 7th of December party, during which word was received that the Japanese had bombed a place we had never heard of, called Pearl Harbor. The party suddenly frivolous, and superfluous. How could we celebrate a table tennis tournament and a musical show when our country had been attacked and our world changed so drastically in the space of a few moments? The party broke up abruptly as everyone left to go home, hurrying through the streets as if bombers were expected to fly over French town at any minute. We had discovered, in one moment on a Sunday afternoon, the world was not a safe place any more. Laurier's drugstore became the gathering spot for the people of French Town who bought the Monument Times or the Wickburg Telegram and discussed the progress of the war, shaking their heads at the swiftness with which the boys of French Town became fighting men. Amazing, Mr. Laurier said. A kid graduates from high school, gets six weeks of basic training with guns and grenades, then overseas he goes on a troop ship and Five months later, five months later, he's fighting the Japs and the Germans. The small red radio on the shelf 
near the soda fountain, blared the news of the day between wartime songs like Rosie the Riveter, which celebrated the working women in the war factories, or the White Cliffs of Dover, which the flyers saw returning to England after bombing raids over Europe. <coughs> Every day, page five of the Times carried stories and pictures of our fighting forces, often announcing medals awarded for valour on the battlefields. Did you hear about Larry LaSalle? Nicole asked breathlessly, rushing into the store one Tuesday afternoon. Although she was speaking to me at the candy counter, the customers turned and listened, and a deep silence fell in the storm. He saved the lives of an entire platoon, she announced. Captured an enemy machine gun nest. It was on the radio. The following Saturday afternoon at the Plymouth, we were stunned to suddenly see Larry LaSalle featured in the movie Tone News. He was unshaven, face gaunt and drawn, eyes sunk deep in their sockets. But it was our Larry LaSalle, all right. Cheers filled the air, feet stomped on the floor, almost drowning out the voice of the broadcaster. A New England Marine is one of the great heroes of Pacific action. Receiving the Silver Star, and again, cheers and applause rocked the theatre, drowning out the rest of the commentary. That night, and the following day, the people of Monument jammed the Plymouth to see the town's first big war hero on the silver screen.